Hello and welcome everybody, my name is Elliot and in this physics help room video, I'm going to teach you all about pendulums. Pendulums are really fascinating systems for learning about a lot of physical principles, and they can come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, but in this video I'm going to focus on the simple pendulum, which means that we have a ball of mass m attached to a rod of length l, which is pivoted at its other end so that the pendulum is free to rotate around. We'll treat the ball as a point particle, and we'll assume that the rod is much lighter than the ball so that we can effectively treat it as being massless. We want to learn to predict the motion of the pendulum, and the first thing we should do is set up some coordinates that specify where it is. We can make different choices here, but I think the simplest coordinates to use would be either the angle theta that the rod makes with the vertical, or the arc length coordinate s that's traced out along the circle that the particle is stuck on. Either one will do the job, and the relation between them is just the definition of the angle theta in radians. It's the arc length s divided by the radius l. Note that when theta or s is equal to zero, that's the equilibrium position of the pendulum, meaning it's gonna happily sit at rest at the very bottom of its arc. Again, the question that we wanna to learn to answer here is how to predict the motion of the pendulum. So say if you were to pull it up to some initial angle and then let it go, or if you were to give the ball a kick to set it moving, what does the resulting motion look like? In Newtonian mechanics, we basically follow a three-step procedure for answering this question. Number one, we draw the free body diagram that shows all of the forces that are acting on the particle. Then in step two, we add up all the forces and write down Newton's second law. The total force equals the mass times the acceleration. Finally, in step three, we solve this equation to figure out the trajectory, r of t. So right now, we're going to apply that three-step procedure to the pendulum. And by the way, I've written up some notes to go along with this video that I'll link below, so if you want, you can take a look after you've watched. So, step one is to draw the free body diagram. And this is just a picture that shows all of the forces acting on the particle. There's only two forces in this particular case. We've got gravity mg pulling straight down, and we have the tension T in the rod pulling back toward the center of the circle. Then step two is to add up the forces and write F equals ma. This is a vector equation, but because the particle is stuck moving around on a circle, we really only care about the component of the force and acceleration that point along the circle. The tension is pointing radially inward toward the center of the circle, which is perpendicular to the tangent direction that we're actually interested in. So the tension doesn't contribute anything to the total force in the tangent direction. The only thing that actually does contribute is the component of gravity that points along the circle. We're gonna to need to do a little bit of geometry work to figure out what this force is. First of all, we can see from this pair of opposite angles that the tension arrow is also gonna make an angle theta with the vertical. Then, since the tension arrow makes a right angle with the tangent direction, we know that the gravity arrow has to make an angle of 90 degrees minus theta with the tangent. So we wind up with a little right triangle with the gravity arrow on the hypotenuse, one leg pointing tangent to the circle, and the other leg pointing perpendicular to the circle. That tangent component is what we're after. It's mg times the sine of theta pointing back toward theta equals zero. By the way, there's actually a faster way to figure out what this tangent force has to be in practice. We know that it's either gonna be mg sine of theta, or it could be mg cosine of theta. But how are we supposed to pick the right one without going through all this geometry work? The trick is to think about limiting cases. For example, when theta equals zero, so that the pendulum is all the way at the bottom of its arc, the tangent direction to the circle is pointing horizontally, while gravity, of course, is still pointing straight down. So in this case, gravity is perpendicular to the tangent direction, and the component of gravity along the circle is zero. That's enough to rule out mg cosine of theta, since if we plug theta equals zero into that, we would have gotten mg times cosine of zero, which is just mg. It's sine of theta times mg that correctly vanishes when theta is equal to zero. Now we're ready to write the component of the f equals ma equation along the direction of the circle. We've only got the one force, minus mg sine of theta, minus because it's pointing back toward equilibrium, so the equation is m s double dot equals minus mg sine of theta. I'm using dots here to denote rates of change with respect to time. So if s of t is the position as a function of time, then s dot is the velocity, or the first derivative of s, and s double dot is the acceleration, or the second derivative of s. 
I want to write everything in terms of theta here. So I'm going to use the fact that s is equal to l times theta to replace s double dot here with l times theta double dot. I'm allowed to do that because l is just a constant. Then I can replace m s double dot on the left hand side of f equals ma with m times l times theta double dot. And then if I cross out some of these common factors, we can simplify our equation to theta double dot equals minus g over l sine of theta. This is what we were after. It's called the equation of motion for theta. It's the differential equation that governs the motion of the pendulum. So that was step two of Newton's procedure. Write down f equals ma. Step three is to actually solve this equation for theta as a function of time. That's pretty hard to do. This factor of sine of theta on the right-hand side makes this a fairly complicated equation. Too complicated, in fact, for us to be able to write down a simple solution in general. But there is one special case where we can write down a simple solution, and that's when theta is small, less than half a radian or so, or around 30 degrees. In other words, if the pendulum doesn't get very far away from equilibrium. In that case, we can apply what's called the small angle approximation, which is the fact that sine of theta and theta itself are very close together when theta is small. The easiest way to see this is just to plot sine of theta and theta on the same graph. In general, of course, the two curves look nothing like each other. But near the origin, in this little window of around half a radian or so, you can see that they're right on top of each other. And if you're familiar with Taylor series, then you know that sine of theta equals theta is just the first term in the Taylor expansion of sine theta around theta equals zero. The upshot of all this is that provided the pendulum never gets very far away from equilibrium, we can approximate the f equals ma equation as theta double dot equals minus g over l times theta itself. This is a much simpler equation, and it's one that we can actually solve pretty easily. First of all, let me define capital omega equals the square root of g divided by l. That way, this factor sitting in front of theta on the right-hand side of the f equals ma equation is just minus omega squared. Then we just have to ask ourselves, what kind of function theta of t, when I take its second derivative, will give me back the same function times this negative number minus omega squared? And the answer is just a sine or a cosine. To see why, remember that the derivative of sine is cosine, and the derivative of cosine is minus sine. That means that the derivative of sine of omega t is cosine of omega t times omega. That extra factor of omega is there because of the chain rule. The derivative of sine is cosine, and then we have to multiply by the derivative of omega t, which gives us another factor of omega out front. Likewise, the derivative of cosine omega t is minus omega times the sine of omega t. Now if we do that again, we get that the second derivative of sine of omega t is minus omega squared times sine omega t. And the derivative of cosine omega t twice is minus omega squared times cosine omega t. And that's exactly what we wanted. The second derivative gives us minus omega squared times the function that we started with. So the general solution to our f equals ma equation when theta is small is theta of t equals a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. A and B here are two constants that will depend on the initial conditions. Where was the pendulum and how fast was it moving when t was equal to zero? If we plug in t equals zero, we get theta of zero equals A, so that A corresponds to the initial angle theta zero of the pendulum. B, meanwhile, is related to the initial angular velocity. Theta dot is minus omega A sine of omega t plus omega B cosine omega t, so that theta dot at t equals zero is just omega times b. That means we could alternatively have written our general solution as theta of t equals theta zero cosine omega t plus theta zero dot divided by omega times sine omega t. And there we have it. We've solved for the trajectory of the pendulum given whatever the initial conditions theta zero and theta zero dot are, provided we don't stray too far from equilibrium. There's a ton of interesting physics to notice here. What we found is that the pendulum will oscillate back and forth around equilibrium in a sinusoidal pattern. That certainly sounds reasonable. For example, if you pull a pendulum up to some starting angle and then let it go, it's going to oscillate back and forth, 
as long as we ignore things like air resistance and friction from the pivot. In other words, the motion will be periodic, meaning it repeats itself over and over again. The speed of the oscillations is characterized by capital omega, which is called the natural frequency of the pendulum. The bigger omega is, the faster the oscillations will be. Notice that omega only depends on the strength of gravity, little g, and the length of the pendulum, l. The longer the pendulum, the slower the oscillations. But omega does not depend on the mass of the particle. Two pendulums, identical except that one has mass m and the other has mass 2m, will oscillate back and forth at the same rate. This is reminiscent of the fact that the acceleration of a falling projectile is always little g, regardless of its mass. Here's a little problem that you should try to test if you're understanding all this. We've got a pendulum that I give a little kick to the left, and then I want you to tell me what its trajectory is going to look like. You don't have to scribble all this down right now. I posted a link down below to a copy of this problem sheet, along with a few other tough physics problems that you should try to stretch your understanding of these concepts. So open that up and give those problems a try after you watch the video. I've also written up solutions, which are posted on my website. All those links are going to be down in the description below. The time it takes the pendulum to complete one full oscillation is called the period, capital T, not to be confused with attention. Cosine and sine complete a full oscillation when their arguments increase by 2 pi. So for example, cosine of omega t is the same as cosine of omega t plus 2 pi. Alternatively, we can express the right-hand side here as cosine of omega times the quantity t plus 2 pi over omega. So the pendulum comes back to its starting configuration after time big T equals 2 pi divided by omega has elapsed, or 2 pi square root of L over G. We actually could have mostly guessed this at the start just by thinking about units. The only way to get something with units of seconds out of L, G, and M is the combination square root of L over G. L has units of meters, G has units of meters per second squared, and so when I divide them, I get seconds squared. Then if I take the square root, I get seconds, which is of course what we wanted for the period. The answer can't depend on the mass of the particle because there's no other parameter to cancel out that factor of kilograms in the answer. That doesn't tell us anything about additional unitless factors, of course, like this factor of 2 pi that actually does show up in the answer. But the point is that thinking about units in physics often gets us 90% of the way toward our answer with very little effort. Also note that our expression for the period doesn't depend on the initial angle theta zero. If we pull two identical pendulums up to initial angles theta zero and two theta zero, they'll swing back to where they started at the same time, as long as theta zero is sufficiently small. That didn't have to be the case. Since theta zero is unitless, we could have imagined multiplying the square root of L over G by any function of theta zero without changing the units of the answer. And in fact, at larger angles, the period of the pendulum does depend on its initial angle, as you can investigate for yourself if you complete the problem sheet that I linked down below. Here's a little animation that I made to show you what the angle as a function of time looks like for the pendulum. I'll link this below so that you can go play with it. You drag these sliders to set the initial conditions for the pendulum, the starting angle and the starting angular velocity. Then press start to let it go and see what the motion looks like. When I release the pendulum from a relatively small initial angle like this, you can see that the motion does look like a cosine function. But if you go play with this and drag it up to a bigger initial angle, it won't look like a cosine anymore because the small angle approximation breaks down. The motion will still be periodic, but it won't be sinusoidal anymore. On the other hand, if I drag the initial speed up to some big value so that I've given the pendulum a big kick, it's not going to oscillate side to side anymore Instead, it'll swing all the way around the pivot. So again, I'll link this below, and I hope you go play with it. I really think it helps to build up your intuition for the physics. I'll also put a link to the notes that I wrote, which you can get for free on my website, as well as the problem sheet where you can test yourself on these concepts and really deepen your understanding of the physics. All right, that's it for this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. Please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment to let me know what you'd like to see me cover in the future. Thanks for watching, everybody.